From the 809 Restaurant and Lounge in the heart of Inwood, New York City, welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air, where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home in what we affectionately call upstate Manhattan. I'm your host, Aaron Sims, and today we welcome producer, promoter, and comedian Eric Vetter. Listeners may know Eric from No Name and a Bag of Chips, the weekly comedy variety show he co-founded and hosts at Word Up Bookstore in Washington Heights and other locations across the city. Now in its 26th year, the show has entertained countless audiences and given the stage to thousands of comics, storytellers, musicians, and performers as they strive to hone their craft. People like Ophira Eisenberg, Tom Shalou, Baratunde Thurston, Joanna Parson, Dave Lester, Hurry Kondabolu, and Cambry Cruz. Cambry Cruz. We're going to talk to Eric today about his two and a half decades entertaining New Yorkers and about what the future holds. But first, let me welcome you, Eric, to In What Artworks On Air. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for letting me get past security. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're very welcome. So uh, since the security lets you in and verified uh, everything, how are you doing today in the new normal? How's it going? I, I'm doing okay. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I now have a stock answer. This has basically been my answer for the last six months. Today I have my job. Today I have my health. I am thankful for today. And that's about as deep as I can get with that, you know? That's a great thing, um, because it has changed day to day here in New York City. Uh, It's been, we're, what, seven, eight months in now, and uh, it has been uh, uh, a never-ending teeter-totter of of emotions, and uh, a lot of people don't have jobs, so, and, and, and most importantly, their health. Uh, yeah. So I'm glad you're you're alive and kicking, so to speak, and uh, and you're here with us, and uh, we're grateful for having you. So, um, 26 years is a remarkable length of time to just survive in comedy, let alone <laughs> to produce a weekly live variety show. So kudos to you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, so why don't you take us back to the start? Okay. Um, little known fact about us, um, <laughs> because overall we're little known. Um, we actually began as a sketch comedy group, the No Name Players. Uh, started it with a very dear friend and, and college uh, cohort, uh, Dawn Owens. And at that time in New York, you couldn't walk down the street without tripping over an improv troupe, but no one was doing live sketch comedy. We thought we had a little niche. We liked acting. We liked writing uh, and performing. And we thought we had a comedic bent, so that's how we started. We actually we did well enough that at one point we were named the New York Post Comedy Pick of the Week when they used to do such things. Um, and before you know it, we were looking for a new home. It didn't get us anything, but it's something we could say, you know? Yeah, well, that's the start. And what, what happened along the way, uh, Dawn actually went back to uh, grad school uh, to get her master's. And um, the idea, we were writing and directing everything. We had a troupe, but, you know, she and I were running the, the thing. And we had talked about doing a variety show format because we knew so many people who were talented and were desperate for stage time. Like, oh, why can't they? So let's provide it. And what we decided to do was, was to, to, while she was in grad school, um, I was going to host such a show, uh, and I was basically minding the store until she came back. Um, and life happens, and she didn't come back. We're still friends, but she, she's not in that game anymore. And the format just stuck. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know, you were born and raised in Washington Heights in the 80s. Yes. Uh, <laughs> How did you have your sights? How, as I said, how early did you have your sights set on? Act, was it was it comedy? Was it acting? Um, it was acting. Was it comedy? It was absolutely okay. acting. Um, I went to City College for seven years. One day I'm gonna go back and get my bachelor's. Um, but uh, during the time there, I I I went in with the idea of going into advertising, and I discovered acting, and that was it. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, of course, along the way, I also had the unfortunate circumstance that responsible for many bad open mics throughout this country. Um, I had friends who said, you're funny, you should do stand-up. 
the absolute worst reason you should ever do stand up. <laughs> um, I mean, it, you know, I, I, I dabbled in it for a long while. I did well enough to get, you know, the occasional paid gigs and stuff, but it wasn't. I loved watching it. It wasn't what I loved doing. I liked the acting and the interacting with other performers and that sort of thing. Uh, and because life is funny, I wound up being more of an MC than either of the other two things. So, um, you know, and I and, and I've no regrets. You know, we've <laughs> we've I've had the opportunity to work with some amazing people along the way, and and it's just fun watching watching stuff develop, you know? Yeah. Well, you said stand-up and improv were exploding at the time uh, when you started doing the sketch. You saw mm -hmm. that, that, that differentiation. Um, but was there a stand-up and improv scene up in Washington Heights Inwood at the time? Oh, that's, you know, it's funny. As long as I've done this, for years and years and years, I resisted any... any uh, Overtures, not that there were that many, uh, but more suggestions from people uh, to try and do something uptown because for the longest, there was there was this, and it, I think we've still got a hint of it, but it, it's not like it was. There, there used to be sort of a mentality of, oh, if it was good, it would be downtown. And I just didn't feel like having to butt heads about that. Um I did eventually get an offer to do uh, w for some decent money to do uh, a show that didn't last for too long, but we brought people in uh, at the old Piper's Kilt, actually, a uh, very beloved place or whatever. But the problem is that uh, a lot of there's not a lot of venues uptown that are naturally suited for it, and and venues again, this is changing. I, mean, I know. A, a lot of wonderful things are happening around, but for most of my time growing up, you know, the venues were not suited for it, and the people, the owners who were willing to take a chance, did so with visions of dollar signs in their eyes. And when it didn't instantly materialize into the place being filled with patrons, uh, you know, it, it takes time to build something, especially with that downtown uptown mentality. Uh, and most places either didn't have or couldn't afford the patience to let it grow. So, I'm sorry, your original question is, was there... I wasn't aware of any uptown improv troops. There were definitely stand-ups who were uptown. There were people who did some good shows, made valiant efforts or whatever. Um, and there was some good work done, but basically nothing lasted because the support system wasn't there. Right. So uh, having no venues uptown to really support this, um, obviously people did live uptown, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh, so where did you go to get your get on stage and do your first gigs uh, in, <laughs> in, in stand up and, and everything else and in, in sketch? Well, I mean, it, there's a couple of routes you can go. If, if, if you're doing stand up, of course, you, you hit every possible open mic anywhere in the city as often as you can if you're serious about stand up. And of course, the opportunities come to, you know, get your head into the established clubs and things. Well, not now, obviously. But um, but uh, as far as like, do you remember your first gig? Your your first your first improv slash stand up. Ah, uh, your solo. You, you know not, not not the sketch, not sketch comedy, but your your my, your, my your, first, your first your first solo. My first solo, uh, I did an uh, open mic night at the now defunct Catch a Rising Star. Uh, and I did well enough to think that I should do it again. And the second time out, I learned I was wrong. I did a third time somewhere. And then, uh, again, because life is strange, I actually got the opportunity to open at people of a certain age who were into dance music in the city will, will remember there was a band... Uh, called D Train, uh, and they were really, really hot in the clubs for a while. Uh, you're the one for me with on every uh, what they would have then termed urban radio station at the time, uh, and they did a concert at City College, and I had a friend who was involved in putting that together, and invited me to open for D Train, 
which was great, except it was my fourth time ever on stage. That was a horrible, horrible decision. <laughs> um, oh, man. I managed to squeeze out a few laughs. Uh, it was two shows. I managed to squeeze out a few laughs in the first one, uh, and the second one is best not remembered. <laughs> um, but I can say I opened for D-Train. Uh, <laughs> which meant something at that time. Which is a lot different than people doing comedy on the D-Train. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's a thin line, my friend. <laughs> um, but you know what? It, but it, since you, you mentioned venues, uh, it's interesting. No Name has, uh, you know, had <laughs> had a very uh, circuitous route to, to the venues that we we work now we 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 absolutely absolutely love the three main places that we do shows now Otto shrunken head on the lower east side word up bookshop very dear to my heart they're they're the ones that i finally i wanted to work with them and they've they've been an amazing place to do amazing things word up bookshop in the heights and QED in Astoria, which is really struggling under the current circumstances, and I, I urge anyone who can help any of these places, but, but QED, I think, is having the, the roughest time. They really should survive. They do amazing things. But as far as No Name, uh, our, we, we had, uh, in the early days, we, we had, like, one kind of regular spot at the West End Gate Cafe, which no longer exists up around Columbia University. Uh, and then we were oddly at Don't Tell Mama's, a piano bar. Sure. Uh, for, for about three years. That's where we got reviewed by the Post. Um, and then the next place we went was, was uh, there's a little black box theater in a building that's since justly been demolished. Um, and someone contacted us to do something there. They needed to fill out some space. And I asked them about doing a regular show there. And for, oh, I don't know, must have been a good five, six years after that, we were there every other Saturday night at midnight in the heart of Times Square in a fifth floor black box theater uh, in a building where the elevator frequently did not work. Um, and since our show was free, uh, a lot of times, like, homeless folks came in to sleep for an hour and a half. Uh, it was a very strange time, but it was, it was an amazing place because they actually gave us the keys to the place. That's amazing. So, yeah, I mean, who does that? It was a resident theater company. Uh, and Which they were one? just you, happy what to was, make, what was the name of the theater company? Uh, Do you the, remember? the Common Basis Theater. Okay. Uh, run by a woman named Marsha Haufrecht, who is uh, a wonderful actress and director and... Uh, she just, I, they just thought like, well, make a couple of bucks when the theater wouldn't be in use anyway. And so it was really cool because whatever play was going on at the time, when we came in there for our show, that was our backdrop. Yeah. There, there was, I, legendary, uh, one point there was, uh, they were doing a show that the entire plays, uh, play was set in a ladies room and they actually set up like a sink with running water uh, a stall with graffiti on there. Uh, I don't know what they did to make that happen because it was like all real. Um, but like, okay, we're going to stand in front of this ladies' room and do comedy now. I bet it informed that set very well. Like your set, the set informed your set. Uh, well, you know, what, what I used to love to watch, and, and, and this is important, when we started doing the, the variety show format, it wasn't just stand-ups. It was mostly stand-ups, but other, but our big thing was uh, we encouraged place, uh, people to use it as a place where they could play and try out new things. So a lot of times, you know, uh, they didn't even, you know, they'd just come with an outline or, you know, ideas or whatever. And what I used to love to watch sometimes is, is the performers come in, see what the set was, and then improvise with that. Uh, they kind of throw away their prepared notes. And, and there was one time there was a, a, a doorway, like downstage center, or almost downstage center. Um, and one performer just basically two thirds of her set, she just kept walking through the door and doing a different line when walking through the door. Um, you know, it's very playful and that's very contagious. 
you know, so that was, that was, <laughs> it was odd, but fun. But after that building was sold, um, you know, when we had to find a new home, we scrounged around for a long while. Uh, and it was kind of a running gag that we were closing places. That, that, that place, uh, the building was knocked down. Uh, we, we went to, do you by any chance, I don't know how long you're in New York, but, uh, Mo Pitkin's House of Satisfaction. Do you by any chance? For, I remember it. It's like 20 years ago, right? Uh, not th- quite. Eh, yeah, I guess it's getting there now. But uh, definitely well over a decade. It was uh, co-owned by Jimmy Fallon, among others. Uh, and it was a, a wonderful place. We got there and we were like, hey, we finally landed in a classy place. And they were closed down in about a year. Uh, so when you bring down the house, you really literally do bring down the this house. This is what I'm saying. Well, this is one reason we love autos because autos is is, is, is freaking indestructible. It's a mainstay. You know, the side for we, sure. We we have been at autos uh, and 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 it, everything's been been fine for for a number of years now. But uh, in our time there, we we <laughs> we've experienced floods. There there was a fire there, uh, and they they are just. They're amazing people, and they're indestructible. That place will be there long after all of us have passed on. Did any particular act of God or fire oh, oh, no, bring no, no. you up? Bring that made you bring No Name uptown? Like what brought you? What brought up? To, uh, you see, because you named it as one of the three places and the Holy Trinity, so to speak, of where you're at right now. You're in three different places. So, what brought the show uptown? Gotcha. Um, it, the thing about Ward Up, you know, I, I mean, I presume you know their history. They're pretty amazing. They they is supposed to be part of it's supposed to be a pop-up bookshop as part of the uptown art stroll uh it was supposed to be there for three weeks and uh at the end of the three weeks they, they didn't leave <laughs> you know and i was only peripherally aware of them during the art show, but I had seen an article about them when it afterwards, like there was community support for it. Folks wanted it to continue. They were doing it out of an abandoned drugstore, so there was no no one who was ready to come in and take over. And and good lord, they they created New York miracles and staying there for as long as they did, and they eventually got their own place. But my thing was when I heard about them, it's like it's just a bunch of artists got together and wanted to create this, and I saw that. They were doing all the. They they turned it into a miniature golf course one night. They they had shows there, performances, and like I, I want to be a part of that. I, I what they're doing is like, and that made me because it made me feel like I'll I'll be, I'll I'll be hanging out with the other misfits, but like people who are serious about their art, though. You know what I mean? Like even if the community's not quite ready to accept it, they will, and you know. It's not somebody who will be looking at us saying we, only 20 people came in and paid a cover tonight. And that made it different. And what I love about Ward Up, when they, you know, I reached out to them and they were very receptive. Uh, Veronica Lou was uh, then as now, like the, the point person for that. Um, and one thing I insisted on, not that there was any any haggling about it, but I wanted to do a show there where um, there would be a little portion set aside for what I call open stage. People can walk in, do whatever they want to do for five minutes. Um, and what I loved is being able to present folks like like Tom Schlue and Carmen Lynch, who was just getting ready to do her first uh, Letterman spot, and Leanne Lord, who'd done, like, everything. Uh, folks like that, and also have someone who walked in from the community also be on the stage the same night, the same bill. And in fact, I vividly remember in their first location, there was a a guy who was staying in the homeless shelter a few blocks away. And he used to come in and read his poetry and we would actually bend the rules. Usually the open stage was at the end of the evening, but he needed to get back by a certain time to, to keep his bed. So, you know, we'd get him up there, whatever. And, he shared some very personal stuff, and it was it was really, I, you know, I've never made his time at any of this, but that made me proud that we could provide a place where this guy who's going through this particular rough journey could share a stage with with people who 
or on television, you know? Yeah. Well, to your credit, you've made no name, uh, particularly, I think it's been reciprocal. I think word up's been great for you, but I think you've also been great for word up with doing what you said. You've created this, this platform for the community to come together, uh, in a true variety show. Uh, as you just kind of said, you, it's you a level playing field. You have all walks of life being able to express themselves in this place. Um, and it's not just comedy or music. Um, so it's poetry. It's all forms of expression. So that may, must raise some very special challenges uh, in creating the show and, and keeping it. But you've been you've been masterful in doing that. Can you speak a little bit about, you know, how you've been able to navigate that? The, the great variety that is, that is, I mean, you, you have to program comedy and music. Uh, it's, it's so much, it's so much around, and obviously, um, the sketch. Well, if I can, I'd, I'd just like to interject to a, a special thank you to uh, the amazing storyteller and author, Michelle Carlo, because she's, she's been a friend of ours for years. She used to perform with us at the Midnight Show um, in deference to, to, uh, propriety. I, I would I would say she was roughly five years old when she did that. Um, <laughs> whew, dodged that bullet. But no. But Michelle, um, you know, uh, when she was first becoming a storyteller, uh, a real storyteller of the, of the quality she had now, she used to do our show a lot, and she was, you know, you, you knew she had something special and. When Word Up first showed up and we started doing shows there, I thought it would be the perfect place to do a regular storytelling edition of, of the show. And I, you know, I travel through the world of, of storytellers. I've, I've been fortunate enough to be invited to do a few, uh, but that's not where I live. I just visit there a lot. And I wanted somebody who was completely immersed in there to make sure that we brought in good people and, and an interesting variety of voices. And nobody does that better than Michelle Carlo. She agreed to do it. And once a month for, for I guess it's at least seven, eight years now, forget exactly when we started, but it was in the original location. And she comes in and she, she's this force of nature, of energy, and you know she's someone who comes out there and you know you're going to have fun. It's going to be a good time. And she just routinely brings in such a wide variety of voices and I think that's a perfect match for Word Up and what they're trying to do and I, I just want to acknowledge because she's kind of helped us take the Word Up show to a different level. Amazing. Many people think that in times of social and political crisis like now for instance uh, comedy is really important because, uh, for example, it can be used to speak truth to power uh, effectively and relatively safe, safely. Uh, do you think comedy comedians um, and their ilk have a particular role to play right now? <laughs> yeah, Given it does. that energy you're talking about, bringing that energy to the community? Well, th this is the thing, you know, it, it, it's weird because, I mean, can you remember the last time there was any major political campaign going on that you didn't like nightly have uh, access to comics doing stand up and you know what have you on it i mean yes there are the talk shows or whatever and they they touch on it in the daily show and things that are vital like that but i i'm it's weird you know what i i watched uh chris rock's opening monologue from last week's saturday night live and it it, it's something I was it's just looking at it because I wanted to see what he's doing. And it was interesting because, like, that's the first time in months I've heard, like, a fresh, you know, real stand up, not these Zoom shows or whatever, which m my heart and, and my love for everyone who's tried to do a Zoom show, but that is, and that's fine. We, we're all doing the best we can in these times. But that's not the same as doing stand up in front of a live audience in a club or whatever, and it was just it was so refreshing to see that again after a while. I think it's important. I I think it's part of why the 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 thing with the state liquor authority banning socially distanced outdoor comedy shows. I think it's just insane, uh, and I think it's 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 damaging. Um, I don't understand why it, they've okayed 
outdoor socially distanced trivia shows, which, by the way, Cambry Cruz pointed out, are more often than not hosted by stand-up comics. Um, you know, I, I think I miss hearing those voices out there, and I know I'm not alone. And it's also, you know, it's, it's rough for, you know, folks who make their entire living out of this. You know, um, I mean, at least e even, I mean, even the bars now are able to be open in various ways, you know, if they follow the conditions or whatever. And we understand the circumstances are different for everybody and we can adjust and all of that. But to say, I, I forget now, I read the language when, it, when the edicts first came down, but I think they only specifically mentioned comedy shows and exotic dancing, uh, which basically nullified my whole act. So I, you know, it's it's disturbing. Um, we won't say which side you wait more towards. <laughs> Give them what they want, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I think the state liquor authority did in my case. But still, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it 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 it's really rough, and that's why QED is struggling right now. It's like Word Up can still they've done a masterful job of 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 creating their online bookshop, and they. They've found ways and GoFundMe and, you know, um, and autos, like I said, they're indestructible. They've found ways to, you know, do what they can under the current circumstances or whatever, outdoor beverages, but, you know, you order food from a place next door or something like that. But, you know, wh whatever their, their setup was, but they, they've, but QED is like, they're not, Yes, they sell snacks and, and wraps and some, some yummy things, but they're not a restaurant. And they do have a backyard, and they were doing some outdoors shows. I actually went to support one of them, and it was amazing. And, like, they're, they're letting diners do shows in, in, in their parking lots, but a place like QED had no, no option but to shut down. They're not receiving financial aid uh, to compensate. There's... You can't take it away from them and offer them nothing in return. I, I think I urge folks to reach out to whatever politicians they can reach out to, um, you know, and, and say, look, we, of course, now by the time anything would happen, we're getting to the winter and, and the game changes again. But I, I, it would be a crime if places like QED had to shut down. Yeah, so here's the million dollar question, Eric. Um, when... When does honest to goodness live entertainment return, and, and 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 when it does, what will it look like? I mean, how is how is how do you think COVID is going to leave its mark on a show like yours and venues like the ones you frequent? <laughs> I'm sorry for for us. They've been trying to kill us for years, and we we won't go away. That's that's the whole secret. They tell you to go home, don't go home. Uh, but as far as real shows in the industry. Um, and clubs and things, you know, I think it probably doesn't have a chance to get back to whatever normal will look like until there's a vaccine. Um, I, I do think we have to adjust as we go along. You know, one thing I love about New York, and I'm really, I'm hoping the numbers don't go back up significantly again, because we, we, we work so damn hard to, to do the right things and and we've made mistakes but we're doing the best we can and there are other parts of the country that just are not doing what it takes to get to that point so I, I, as long as that continues i think the only hope is, is is for the vaccine which i believe will come i'm just wondering you know how many how many venues will be left standing at that point for whatever it's worth in terms of the art form, it's going to go on. Uh, it will always go on. It will adapt. Uh, and even if the venues where we're used to seeing these things now do sadly close down, they'll be replaced by new ones when, when, when the dust has settled. I just hope that the good ones and, and the ones that have really tried to do the right things all along the way will not be among those lost along the way. Well, I agree with you. And for those who don't know, Eric has been 
uh, incred incredibly persistent and resilient uh, in keeping no name on, in a virtual venue. What I've been doing is, uh, yeah, share, what I call a shared clip show. Um, basically, I, I had a lot of people urging me to do Zoom shows, and, and anyone I know whose opinion I trust has said, yeah, I did them, I hate them. Um, what I thought we would try and do is, is I'd come out and just basically tell people we missed them and then show some clips of people who would normally be performing at our shows from shows that they've done in front of live right. audiences. Right, it was pre-taped. Exactly, so you can see them doing what they really do. Uh, what I presently do is one on the second and fourth Tuesday uh, of every month at 7 p.m. I go live on Facebook. I run my mouth for a couple of minutes, and then I put the clips in the comments. It's very simple and very, very do-it-yourself and paint-by-numbers, but um, but that's what I do. Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, I mean, so now I'm doing, uh, <laughs> second and, th and fourth Tuesdays, we do one uh to to honor word up and at times we would normally be do we're normally there every tuesday uh we've been i've been doing one on the third friday of month uh in honor of autos and uh one on the fourth friday of month uh in honor of qed uh we always try and put in the comments not just the clips but like places where uh, Links where you can go support them, buy merchandise, whatever. You can help them get a couple of bucks in the meantime, even though we realize no one's got any any bucks. Well, I totally understand. Um, so, but I just want people to know that you have done quite a lot, and uh, and your efforts are. You'll be around at the end, I believe, as well. So, Eric, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, it's been a delight. Uh, what's the best place for our listeners to keep track of future shows and other, other projects? Uh, hit, hit me up on Facebook. Follow me on Facebook. And there's a no-name page on Facebook as well, uh, which you can find through my Facebook page. We, we have a website, but it's, let's just say, under construction. That's the easiest version. <laughs> It will be back, but when it is, I'll mention it on my Facebook page. Okay, Eric. Well, listeners, you can find those links up on the InWhatWorks website when they do appear, uh, <laughs> when we have them. So thanks to Eric Vetter for joining me on this Artist Spotlight episode of InWhatWorks On Air, where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home in Upper Manhattan. If you have a moment, please show us some love right now by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts. That really helps. Deep thanks to all here at 809 Restaurant and Lounge in Inwood for hosting us and to Heightsites.com for our local uptown promotional support. Be sure to follow us on social media at Inwood Artworks to keep up with all that we do, including the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Al Fresco, pop-up art galleries, live performances, and so much more. You can support On Air and all our programming by making a tax-free donation at InwoodArtworks.nyc slash donate. Inwood Artworks is made possible with funding from NYC and Company Foundation with support from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and the Niska Electronic Media and Film Grant Program in partnership with Wave Farm Media Arts Assistance Fund and the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims for Inwood Artworks On Air.